Good morning. Something that I think is a lot of fun in the English language, and I don't know, I'm not uh, multilingual, so I don't know if they're in other languages, I'm sure they are, is uh, misnomers. Calling something the wrong thing or, or naming something the wrong thing. Uh, you have, have you ever met somebody named Joy? And you're like, you got a middle name? You, ain't, you met somebody named Grace? Just very clumsy, you know? Uh, we do that to, to people. We do that to, to geographical locations. Uh, I learned this week that, that there's five rivers in, uh, in the UK called Avon, the River Avon, uh, five of them, uh, which is kind of funny in itself until you realize that Avon is, I think, the Celtic word for river. So it's river, river, five times. Uh, we do this with animals. God, animals are so many misnomers, right? Koala bear, panda bear. They're, they're, they're not bears. Uh, they're, they're related to other, uh, I don't know, I don't do biology, but they're, they're related to other things. Maybe they're their own category, I don't know. But we name them. They look like a bear. We're going to call it a bear, right? We have misnomers, and they get adopted over time, and most of the time it's innocuous. It's kind of something that we, we chuckle at. But there are some times where things are named the wrong thing, and it does damage. And I think one of the things that has acquired a misnomer is that we call this in here worship. Now, it is worship. We give praise and we sing to the Lord. It absolutely is worship. The problem is that we think what happens in here is worship, and everything that happens out there is not. That that's not worship. This is something different than out there. And it is different, but it's still worship. You can worship in here, you can worship out there. Then we try to qualify it, and so we call this corporate worship. Does that mean that we can't worship as a people out there? Does it not mean when we work together and serving, that's not corporate worship? And so what I want us to talk about today is worshiping with one another. We're in Ephesians 5, uh, verses 15 to 20. And I want us to talk about how we can worship together, worshiping with one another. Because our tendency is to think, again, that, that we, don't, we, do, we just do this together here, and then we go out into our week, and we're separated, and we're scattered to the winds, and so we don't necessarily know how to worship with one another. You're going to have an opportunity this week, many of us on Thursday, we're going to gather together. And it's going to be hard. It might be challenging. You might sit there and wonder, what is it that I'm doing here? What is Thanksgiving even supposed to be? Is it okay if I just pray before a meal? What if getting together with your family or your friends this week was an opportunity to worship with one another? What would that look like? How would I do that? So we're going to talk today about how we worship with one another, three ways to worship together. And the first one is we worship together in wisdom. We worship together in wisdom. Look at verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Because we're going through this series on one another, we, we've picked kind of the, the expressions one another out of the book of Ephesians. And so what's happened is we've kind of landed in the middle of some of Paul's thoughts, and this has happened here. We're landing in the middle of some, one of his thoughts, and he, he tells us what he's trying to explain. In verse 1, it says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fav- fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Paul is telling us how to walk, how to live our lives, how to conduct ourselves. And what he's telling us is this is how you worship. This is how you live a life of worship, whether you're in church or out of church, it doesn't matter. Where, how do you worship? And we know this for two reasons. One, he uses the word be imitators. He says be imitators. The word is mimetes. It's where we get the word mimic from. He's saying to mimic God, mimic God. We were made in his image. We're created in his image. We're supposed to mimic him in certain ways. Now, the Greek word for uh, image that's used in Genesis 127 in the Greek translation of the Old Testament is actually icon. It makes sense, right? An icon, a picture. But mimic can also be used to describe something that's an image, a copy of it. We're designed by God to show the world, to show the rest of creation, to show one another what he is like. 
Our intention was when we, when we looked at another person, we were supposed to see the reflection of our creator. So we know that that is worship. That's what we created to do. But secondly, notice Paul says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. He's saying the reason why we worship, the reason why we imitate is because we're loved by God. So many other forms of worship, so many other religions worship God to gain something from him especially pagan worship, right? The gods of Greece and Rome, you offered sacrifices, you gave things to to the gods so that they would bless you or maybe they just wouldn't get in your way, right? Because they were capricious and cruel. But God loves us. He's already given his love to us. He's poured out his love on us. We're beloved children. Therefore, we respond in worship. We're not trying to get anything from God when we worship. We're saying thank you. We're showing our gratitude to him. And so verses 3 through 14 of this passage are all the ways you don't do this, all the ways to not say thank you, sexual immorality, covetousness. Of course, joking is talked about there, partnering with people who do all these things. Living a lifestyle like this is a way in which you tell God no thank you. It's a way in which you don't worship God. Verses 3 through 14 is the unworship of God. And so in 5.15, Paul says that we're supposed to live in response to God first, not as unwise, but as wise. This is to walk as not as unwise, but as wise. Walking is is the biblical way of saying live a lifestyle. This should characterize your lifestyle. The most important thing about your life should be how you worship God, how you live your life, living wisely, not as unwisely. We all know the most famous book in the Bible about wisdom is Proverbs. It's Proverbs, okay? The chapel was also fairly weak in that, so it's Proverbs, right? Makes sense. And Proverbs often talks about wisdom being a path, being a walkway. It says the path of the righteous, the path of the upright, the path of life is wise, In chapters 1 and chapters 2, the writer of Proverbs is telling his son to stay on the path of wisdom, follow the path, and you'll, you'll live a fruitful life, a happy life. Folly and foolishness is often characterized as a, as a harlot or a prostitute calling for you to leave the path and enjoy folly and foolishness. So if wisdom is a way to worship, what is Wisdom, or if wisdom is the way we're supposed to live our life, what is wisdom? Well, again, we turn to the book of Proverbs. Better, better. You can be taught. This is good. Proverbs 1, 7 and 9, 10 say that the fear of the Lord is what? Beginning of wisdom. That's right. It's the beginning of wisdom. So if the fear of the Lord, I can't think of a better expression that describes worship than the reverence of the fear of the Lord, ascribing to him his proper place, recognizing that it's appropriate to worship God is wise, it is worshipful, recognizing that I respond to God's revelation of who he is and his love for me is wise. It makes sense. If he is the creator and I am the created, then obviously I worship him. That is wise. That makes sense. Praise flows upward. Glory flows upward. And so wisdom and worship in community, though, what does this look like in community? What does this look like for us to worship one another? Well, there has to be this recognition that I don't always do this. Y'all, this may come as a surprise, but I am not always wise. My mom and dad are here today, and they can tell you stories (laughs) of how Travis has not always been wise. I sometimes, I wish it was as infrequently as sometimes, I often do not walk wisely in my worship of God. I get distracted, I get frustrated, and I need the community to come around me and say, Travis, remember his goodness. Remember what he's done for you. Remember how he loves you. Respond to his love. And so we surround ourselves with people like that. And again, we look at Thanksgiving coming up, and sometimes there's not an option as to who you surround yourself with at Thanksgiving, right? You got some joys coming 
to Thanksgiving this year, right? Maybe something you can do is beforehand surround yourself with those people. Go to friends that you know are fellow worshipers of God and say, hey, I need prayer this Thanksgiving because it's going to be hard. Because somebody's going to be there that, that just really knows how to push my buttons and they're going to, or somebody's not going to be there that's supposed to be. And my heart is broken. Surround yourself with those people who will call you to worship. But there's a catch here. There's a catch in worshiping with one another, in this wise walking in wisdom. And notice what it says in verse 16, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. There's, there's are two qualifications there. Because I don't always let people know I'm struggling. The community of faith cannot come around you and help you if we don't know that you're struggling. And that we live in a society where, where it's, we, it's encouraged to hide the truth. It's encouraged to pretend like you have it all together. In fact, it's almost a survival mechanism, right? You don't let people in. You don't let people see you struggle. But that's, again, not what's said in verse 16, verse 16 here, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. There's two qualifications here. One, if I have to be told to make the best use of the time, the implication is that I don't always make the best use of the time, right? We're prone to distraction. We live in an incredibly distracted society. I focus on the wrong things. I worship my TV. I worship my sports. I worship my family, my hobbies, my job. I need people who are going to come around me and say, Travis, you're getting a little too focused on that. You're a little too much on your phone. You're a little too much, you're too concerned with this. We need to be surrounded with people who will do many interventions in our lives. Not M-A-N-Y, but M-I-N-I, many, tiny. Tiny interventions in our life. Hey, Travis, focus. Secondly, the days are evil. The days are evil. So many of us live as if we think that the time that we have are, is neutral. We think I can either do something good with it or I can do something bad with it, but it's fairly neutral. It's not what Scripture teaches. There is evil in the world. And one of our mistakes is we think that evil is this impersonal thing that happens. There is a mastermind, a villainous mastermind behind the evil in the world. And again, I don't want to find Satan under every rock. That's not what I'm trying to do here. But we need to recognize that if you do not take advantage of your opportunities to worship God, both in this room and outside of it, someone else will take advantage of that time. And they will use it for evil purposes. In a spiritual battle that we often are unaware of, evil is real and it's intelligent. And it masterminds everything counter to God. And so again, I need the community to come around me, to keep my head in the fight, to keep my head in the game, to keep my heart in it. Because I need the community to remind me of verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The will of the Lord. When you see this in Scripture, uh, it can be easy to uh, say this is the same thing as the will of God. And, and, and it might be. Paul just might be doing some flowery language here. But when I looked up the expression, the will of the Lord, it doesn't happen that often in Scripture. The will of God is all over the place. But the will of the Lord often appears in situations of judgment. And so Hophni and Phinehas, who are the sons of Eli in 1 Samuel, uh, they, they, they wind up being put to death, and it says, uh, or they wind up dying in battle, and it says, because it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. You see this a number of times, the will of the Lord, the will of the Lord. It's this idea of judgment. And so what does this have to do with what we're reading today? Well, oftentimes I can get overwhelmed by evil. I mean, right? You, you turn on the news, you turn on, uh, you listen to podcasts. You, it doesn't take long to, to, to get overwhelmed by the, the, the weight of evil in our society, the weight of evil in the world, the, the heinous things that are done. And I can think that evil's winning. I can think in some cases that evil has won, that we've lost. But the will of the Lord, that judgment that's being talked about in relation to the evil days, is that God one day will judge the evil in the world. He'll do away with it. And we'll live in a world free of evil. And I need people around me to look me in the eyes when I get discouraged and say, Travis, evil does not have the final say. It's not, it hasn't won. 
nor is it even winning. Evil is losing. And I know that's hard to see, it's hard to sense that, but it's true. And so because I'm subjected to distraction, to evil manipulations, and subject to forget that God will overcome those evil manipulations, I often forget to stop worship, uh, to, to worship. I stop worshiping. And that's many of us as well. You get distracted, you get overwhelmed, and you stop worshiping. And so when I stop worshiping, I stop living wisely. I stop following the path. And I need people. I need brothers and sisters to come around me to help me stay on the path. Now, here's the thing. There are other religions, other faith practices that worship in community as well. And there are some that seemingly, from the outside, look like they do a whole lot better a job than we do. Let's be honest. So what's the difference? Well, look at verse 18, because we don't just worship together wisely. We worship together in the Spirit. Verse 18, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. As a Baptist pastor, getting a, a verse on alcohol is like a fastball down the middle of the plate. You just, you just want to swing so hard. But I'm going to temper myself here, okay? Temperance, huh, ironically. Most of us see this verse, and many of us in our life, if you, if you grew up in a Baptist church, this is one of the verses that was used to tell you not to drink, right? Don't drink. Alcohol is bad. You're supposed to be filling up on Jesus, not filling up on booze, uh, that kind of stuff. And many of us have been taught uh, something that Frank Sinatra said, actually, about alcohol, is that alcohol is man's worst enemy. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the quote. And even though we've been taught the first part of the quote, many of us live the second part of the quote, which Frank Sinatra said, alcohol is man's worst enemy, and the Bible says to love your enemies. <laughs> many of us live that way. I'm not going to get into whether or not alcohol is bad or good or whatever today. Maybe we should. But what I am going to say is if you think that verse 18 is just about drinking alcohol, well, you've probably been drinking because that's not just what it's about. The problem with alcohol is that it distorts our reality. It distorts our reality. That's the problem. That's why we don't want people to drink and drive because reality is distorted. It can make a, good idea, a bad idea seem like a good idea, right? Because it distorts reality, right? Alcohol plus, hey, watch this, is a terrible combination. It distorts reality. It, 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 it distorts our emotions, right? People who are prone to anger maybe become more angry. People that are prone to, to sadness become more sad. People that are prone to joy become more joyful. It distorts reality. That's the effect that it has on us, and that's one of the reasons why we turn to it. It's one of the reasons why we like it. It, it, it allows us to become something, someone else, to escape or, or, or whatever. It makes things funnier, right? There's a reason why a comedy club has a two-drink minimum. Sometimes I think we should institute that here. Just kidding, kidding. See what I mean? We need it. Travis, you need to move on from the alcohol thing. Again, I'm Baptist. Old habits die hard. We live in a society, though, where alcohol is one of many avenues that we have to distort reality. We don't just have to turn to alcohol. I have countless forms of entertainment that will distort reality for me if I want to escape. We have the news that distorts reality for us. If we, if we just focus on one uh, uh, medium of news, right, it can distort reality. We, we look through one lens of the world around us. Advertisements distort reality. If I have this car or I have these clothes, then I will feel and be this way, right? We have our careers, our money, our prestige that makes us think that we're more important and more significant perhaps than we really are. We have healthcare, we have medicines that make us think we're invulnerable, that the doctors will just take care of it, and we are filled with these things. And when we're filled with these distractors of worship, we can't worship. When we're filled with these things, these, these uh, distorters of reality, you can't worship. That's why it says, be filled with the Spirit of God. You can't really worship in truth if reality is distorted. And the biggest thing, the biggest change in reality that we run to is the sentiment that I don't need God. 
As long as I have this thing, this distorter of reality, whatever it is, whether it's, whether it's in a bottle, whether it's, it's your career, whether it's your family, whatever it is, as long as I have this thing, I don't need God. I have my significance. I have my importance here. And what's more is I don't need other people. I only need to worship me. And so what winds up happening is many of us show up, in, uh, show up to church every Sunday as drunk as we can be, and not on alcohol and certainly not on the Spirit of God. We are drunk on our own self-worth and our own self-importance. We have a hangover from a week of in, in, imbibing our own comforts, our own prestige, applauding ourselves, patting ourselves on the back. And we show up here, and we've been drinking so deeply from the cup of our own self-importance that we think we're doing God a favor by sitting in a pew. And we take that attitude everywhere we go throughout the week. I'm blessing you by being here. I'm blessing these people by being in their presence. They're better off because I'm here. They need me. They can't do this without me. And so we have to recognize something. And this is crushing crushing to recognize, but we need to admit it. In order for us to worship and to be filled with the Spirit, you have to come to one conclusion, and it is that God does not need you. God does not need you. God has no need of anything that he has created, and that includes you. That includes me. God does not need us. You cannot worship God in and of yourself. If your approach to God is you're bringing him something that he needs, then that is not worship. That is worship of self. And this is why we need to be filled with the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God empowers us. Again, notice in 18, it says, be filled with the Spirit. Now, when you become a believer in Jesus, when you trust in Christ as your Savior, the Spirit of God comes and lives inside of you. He indwells you. But And that just happens. That's like a a promise. That's just something that God gives to us. But here it's telling us in a command to be filled, a passive command, but it's still a command to be filled with the Spirit, which means there's probably a difference between indwelling and being filled. And I think being filled is the idea of empowerment. Uh, Oheliab and Bezalel, who are two guys in Exodus, which if you're looking for baby names, just throwing them out. Oheliab and Bezalel, great. If you've got twins, can't think of a better name. They were empowered. It says the Holy Spirit filled them so that they could construct the elements that go into the temple for worship or to the tabernacle for worship. Peter is filled with the Spirit of God when he preaches in Acts. Elizabeth, when she meets Mary, who's pregnant with Jesus, she's filled with the Spirit of God and she prophesies over them. To be filled with the Spirit of God is empowerment. God fills us to act. He empowers us to great acts of worship, and not just on Sunday morning. You can be filled with the Spirit at any time. You can be filled with the Spirit of God as you go through work, as, you, as, you, as you're having Thanksgiving dinner this week. So many of us need to sober up. We need to stop drinking so deeply from the cup of our own self-worth and importance and start asking the Lord to fill us with his spirit. And that's what you have to do. You have to ask. And I think one of the reasons why we like so much to fill up on our own self-worth and importance is because it's convenient. The command here to be filled is a passive command. You don't do it. You allow God to do it to you. And that requires patience. That requires asking. That requires seeking him. But so many of us have these, uh, have at our own home, we have a wine cellar of our own self-worth, or we have a tap of our own self-worth at home, and we just fill it up and drink it. And we don't have to wait on God to fill us up, because we can fill ourselves up on everything that we think we need. We have to ask Him to fill us up. Spirit-filled worship is somebody admitting that I will not be filled up by anything else except for God. But it's also a recognition that because of my failures, because of my tendencies to fill myself up with other things, I don't deserve to be worshiping. I don't deserve to have God accept my worship. And it's trusting him. It's allowing him to fill me up. And we'll talk about how we do that in just a second. But I need the community of faith to come around me and remind me that sometimes... I'm a little self-focused. 
I'm a little self-important. I need God to bring people into my life that are going to challenge my view of myself. And we need each other to do this. This is one of the reasons why Alcoholics Anonymous is so successful because it's people coming around in a room and all admitting that they have a problem and they need people to help them. When we come here on Sunday morning, the foundational component of worship, when you walk in these doors, is not I have it all together. To be a Christian worshiper of God is to come into a room and say, hi, my name is Travis, and I worship myself more often than I should, and I need help. Will you help me? This right here is Worshippers Anonymous. That's what this is. This is what this is supposed to be. And then we all encourage one another, we practice together, and then we go out into our week so we can worship together more. And the reason why there's a day of the year where we give thanksgiving to God is because God does not let us stay in a position where we think to ourselves, I don't have anything to offer. Now, just because God doesn't need anything doesn't mean you don't have anything to offer. So let's worship together in thanksgiving. This is the last point today, worship together in thanksgiving. Verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What happens next is the closest you will ever get to the Bible telling us our lives should be more like the sound of music, songs and hymns and singing together. We're supposed to lift one another up. We're supposed to encourage one another in music. Now, the reason why this is, I think, I think there's a lot of practical reasons why music is highlighted here, right? I think, one, we need to admit the fact that we remember songs way better than we remember sermons. Pains me to admit that. Maybe I'll start singing my sermons. <laughs> Do you know how quickly I would be out of a job? It would be very fast. No, songs are used to teach. That's why correct theology in our singing is so critically important. Because I walk out of here with a song in my head. And so God teaches us through the music we sing. It's so important. That's why I'm thankful for Stephen and our orchestra and our choir. They teach us. Songs encourage and uplift. Oftentimes you hear a really great song. And you may not be in a good mood, but man, there's a song that can just put you in a great mood, right? There's also songs that can put you in bad moods, right? If you have kids and you have to listen to a Frozen song for the 900th time. <laughs> songs express emotions that we don't even have words for. I would never know to sing some of the words that we sing. But because somebody else, God has used someone else to pin those words, those can be the expressions of my heart as well. Songs tell a story. They reinforce the gospel. But notice, if we're going to sing to one another, we're going to speak songs to one another, there's a qualifier, and most of us miss this, and it's not uh, make a joyful noise. We go to making a joyful noise a lot, which is great. Praise God. But notice what it says in verse 19, making melody to the Lord with your heart. The only instrument required to worship the Lord in song is with your heart. You don't have to play an instrument. You don't have to sing that well. Praise God. Your heart. The heart is the seed of the emotion. It's the core of the person. And so often our heart is not tuned to sing to the Lord. Our heart is tuned to sing to ourselves. We sing in our own key, in our own uh, uh, value of ourselves. We don't worship from the heart. And because we don't worship from the heart, we miss an opportunity to be grateful. But this is all the reason why we have to be grateful. Because our hearts need to be transformed. They need to be changed. The story of the Old Testament is the people of God trying again and again and again to worship God and failing. They try for a little bit, they succeed for a little bit, and then they fail. And then they'll try, and then they fail. And then there's David, and they try really well for a while, and then they fail. And then God, in Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27, says, I'm going to give you a new and a transformed heart. I'm going to change your heart so that you can stop failing. You can worship me. And he does this by sending his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, to... to, to Allow us to worship him, to transform our hearts. See, what they don't tell us, what the world doesn't tell us, is that all this drinking that we do of our own self-worth and our own self-importance comes with a chaser. And again, if you grew up Baptist and you don't know what a chaser is, it's a drink after the drinking. The chaser 
of drinking of our own self-worth and self-importance is God's wrath. You see, when we drink so deeply about our own self-worth and importance, what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up as God. And we're setting ourselves up as a rival God. And if you know anything about God, he is the only God. And so he doesn't broke with having other gods. He can't abide having a rival God. And so his wrath is poured out on rival gods. You see it throughout the Old Testament, God tearing down idols, destroying worship of other gods. And so when we set ourselves up in that position, we have created ourselves to be images or enemies of God. That sounds terrifying. It should be. It is. Except there is one, and his name is Jesus Christ, who drank the chaser for us, who came. That's why he says in the garden, God, let this cup, the cup of God's wrath, pass before me. I don't want to drink it, Lord. But he does it anyway because he's obedient and because he is the perfect worshiper of God. He has walked wisely. He has walked uh, justly. He has walked in such a way that is worshipful. And so the question now for you today is for your heart to be transformed, have you allowed, have you trusted Jesus to pay for that for you, to drink that for you? Or are you still counting on yourself to drink it? Are you still trusting in yourself to be able to handle that? Oh, Travis, I can handle that. That's no problem. I'm not scared. Maybe so. But Jesus has died so that we can have a changed heart. And when you have that changed heart, you offer gratitude. You give him thanks. That's what worship is. It's gratitude. It's offering heartfelt gratitude to God for what he has done. If you're convinced that God has done all of this, then you can worship. You need the transformed heart. You might say, Travis, why is it so bad if I'm self-centered? Why does it matter if I drink so deeply for my own self-worth? The problem is you weren't created to do that. If you were created, fine. But you're created to be not just about yourself. And you'll say, well, Travis, I'm not. I have my friends and my family and my job and my career and my legacy and all my stuff. But look at all the modifiers that you just threw in front of those words. My, 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 mine. We live our lives. One of the key instances that you know if you don't have a transformed heart is is if you live your life in the first person singular. You were created to live it in the second person singular. You, you, you. The transformed heart tunes our heart and begins to change our worship. We don't sing the solo anymore. We sing the corporate song to God. This corporate song of gratitude. So how do we do this? Well, one, take whatever you have been given, whatever God has blessed you with, and start using it to give him thanks. The hallmark of the ungrateful person is that they don't have what they need. How many times does a kid receive a treat, like a piece of cake, and they'll be like, is that it? I want a bigger piece of cake. That person got a bigger piece of cake. Why don't I get a big piece of cake? I want the end piece. It's confessional. I just always want the end piece. The truest statement that you are ungrateful is that you think you need more. God has given you plenty to worship him with. Take what you have. If you are limited on time, take what you have and pray. If you can't come and serve this afternoon, fine. You're busy. But you can pray. You can pray for those boxes that go out. You can pray for the decorations that go up in this room and across our campus because people who never darken the doors of the church will come here at Christmas and we want our place to feel welcoming And your prayers will help make that happen. And then don't wait until next week to start worshiping. So many of us are going to leave and be like, wow, Travis, it would have been really nice to hear that sermon before we sang all those songs. You missed the point if you think that. You can worship this afternoon. You can worship this evening. You can worship on Thursday at Thanksgiving. Let your transformed heart sing. And if you do not have one, if you don't have a transformed heart, The greatest act of gratitude you can tell the Lord is, Lord, I need a transformed heart. Because we have been given an opportunity to worship our creator, to be right with him, to be made right with him. So worship with wisdom together. Worship in the spirit together. And give him so much thanksgiving and let us do it together. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the worship that you have given us to to offer to you. You've given us a job, a task, a purpose, a 
calling, and is to give glory to our God who has made us. Lord, forgive us for the ways in which we drink so deeply from fountains of our own importance. And instead, Lord God, may you change our hearts, tune our hearts to worship you. That's in your son's name we pray. Amen.